G'day everyone. Today I want to talk about fast and slow processes. We've already talked a bit about fast processes. That's the instantaneous process. So let's just formalize what we mean by the instantaneous process. Here we're going to have a Hamiltonian, which depends on time, and it starts off at h naught for time t less than zero, and at time t equals zero, it suddenly changes to a different Hamiltonian, h1. And so this is the example that we saw where you have a particle in a square well, for example, and then suddenly at time t equals zero, the wall moves back, and now we have a bigger well. And so that happens instantaneously, and the wave function, it kind of gets surprised when this transition happens fast. So for example, if we write down the wave function before the transition takes place, sorry, before the process happens, before, before time t equals zero, uh, then these are the eigenstates. And if the transition happens fast, then the wave function is surprised. So the wave function at time t immediately after zero plus a little bit is the same as the wave function at time t zero minus a little bit happens too quickly. And so we can write that wave function at time t equals zero as the eigenstate that it was originally in. And we can express that as a sum over the states of the final Hamiltonian, psi m1. So these psi m1 are eigenstates of h1. And so the example that we often see, apart from the one that I showed earlier, is the tritium decay to uh, helium. So there's a hydrogen atom where the hydrogen atom has a tritium nucleus at the center, two neutrons and one proton, and it undergoes a beta decay instantaneously to helium-3. And that happens to the surprise of the orbiting electron. So if we look at what happens to the eigenstates, uh, the eigenenergies as a function of time, it looks something like this. There's the energies as a function of time. And of course, the all the energies are less than zero. Originally, we have a hydrogen-like atom. That's minus 13.6 electron volts and n equals one. And then you've got n equals two n equals three, and so on. And then at time t equals zero, you have a sudden change and it becomes a helium atom. So the energy level E n equals minus Z squared over N squared times the Rydberg. So when Z equals Two, that's four Rydbergs, which is minus 54 electron volts, or thereabouts. Um, that's n equals one. And this will be n equals two, at almost the same energy as the n equals one from hydrogen. And 
n equals 3, and so on. And so on this side, you've got hydrogen, and this side, you've got helium spectrums. So the question is, what happens? Well, you've got a wave function that starts off at the n equals 1 on the hydrogen side. And then at time t equals 0, suddenly the potential changes. And so it ends up a little bit down at n equals 1. and a little bit at n equals 2. And if you do the maths on it, if you had 100% of the wave function in n equals 1, then you find that you end up with something like 70% down here at n equals 1 in helium. So 70% stays in the ground state as the potential goes from hydrogen to helium. And around 25% is here at n equals 2. And the other 5% are n equals 3, 4, 5, and so on. So this is a typical fast transition type problem. You have an instantaneous change. Now we're going to move on to the slow process. And we call this the adiabatic process. And we can write it something like this. We've got a time-dependent Hamiltonian, which is starting off at h naught, and it changes in the following way. So it's h naught for time t less than zero. It's h naught plus some slowly varying potential v for times t between naught and big T. And then it's in its final state, which I called h1 before, the time t greater than big T. And we can draw that, and don't think too hard about this picture, but if we imagine a kind of picture of the Hamiltonian, so this is, don't ask what this vertical axis is, all right? It's Hamiltonian space. It starts off at some value, and then slowly changes up to some other value. And the point is that that has to happen slowly. So this side over here, it's H naught, and over here it's H naught plus V. So that's our setup. And the point is that for our slow process, our adiabatic process, T is large. And so change is slow. And we'll quantify exactly what we mean by fast and slow towards the end of this video. How do we treat this kind of process? Well, one of the useful things that we can define is the concept of instantaneous eigenstates of the slowly varying Hamiltonian. And we can make sure that they're also orthonormal to each other at all times t. These are not solutions of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. In fact, they're very strange functions indeed. What we're doing here is we are taking the Hamiltonian at a particular instant in time, and then we're solving the time-independent Schrodinger equation for that uh, for that particular Hamiltonian at that particular time. Because H is changing, we cannot define specifically a time-independent Schrodinger equation, right? We, we To get the time-independent Schrodinger equation, we assume a steady state. So really, this is a kind of a, a funny set of eigenstates. But nonetheless, they're a useful construction for us. What are the solutions of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation? Well, let's write it out. I, H bar. So we have a time-dependent wave function, big psi. And that's going to be the solution. Fine. And then what we do is we make the assets that we can express this wave function in terms of 
the instantaneous eigenstates. And while we do this, we'll pull out a couple of phases. So we need to express this thing as a sum over all states, n, and I want to add one phase factor here which is e to the i theta n t. This is sort of a dynamical phase factor. So this dynamical phase runs with time. It's a natural extension to the usual e to the minus i e t over h bar that we get from the time independent Schrodinger equation, but with a time varying energy. Now what we actually find, and I'm not going to prove that in this video because I just want to concentrate on the physics in this video, but what we actually find is that if there are no transitions then we can write the CN as a differential equation. So in that case we can write CN dot is approximately equal to minus CN which is of course the time varying uh, coefficient times the overlap of psi n with its time derivative. And that we can solve. Uh, so that we see n at time t equals zero times a phase factor e to the i gamma n of t. That phase factor can be written like this, and it's a real quantity. The i out here is converting the stuff that's inside the integrand, which is pure imaginary, and that's easily easily shown. And this is another way to write it. And this is called uh, the geometric phase, for reasons we'll see later on, or Berry phase, Berry's phase. So the big thing that I haven't explained at all is that I've just said if there are no transitions from n to m and this big assumption that I've made right here there are no trend this does not happen uh, then I can write this cn only in terms of this and we only get a phase factor which comes in to this uh, coefficient up here. So that's a big if, and it's a it's a key point of the adiabatic uh, process is that there are no transitions. So we'll prove that in the later video, or at least we'll justify it. In adiabatic case, you have the dynamical phase. We have the Berry's phase, and we have the instantaneous eigenstate. And so if we start off at time t equals zero in the state psi n at t equals zero, in other words, equivalently cn at time 0 is equal to 1, uh, then what we're talking about, we have our eigenstates, e, and time is going like this, and we have all of our eigenstates which start off, and then time t equals 0, the Hamiltonian starts changing, so these guys start moving around, and something like this until they stabilize at some time big T 
and you know maybe they're a little bit something like that and so what it means if we start off here in some state n then we stay following that trajectory and we don't move even if and this is the case here if you have a final energy which is closer to the original it doesn't matter it still just follows it tracks it in time and we don't have transitions in the adiabatic case providing that uh, the transitions happen sorry that the adiabatic process happens slowly enough so we can say about this that quantum numbers don't change under the adiabatic process in other words, if you start off in the state with eigenvalue n, you'll end up in the state with eigenvalue n, even though uh, the wave function corresponding to that uh, quantum number has changed over time. So the last thing we need to do is talk about how slow is slow and how fast is fast. So a slow process here is one where the length of time is much much bigger than the ratio h bar over delta e n m in other words you're starting off in the state n and you've got all the other states m including the nearby states that you can transition into and the point is that that time should be much much bigger than h bar over that delta e so remember that the rabi time which we could define as something like one over omega nm, um, which is equal to h bar over delta e nm. And so you can see that what we're saying is that the time should be much, much bigger than the Rabi time. And similarly, how fast is fast we would say the opposite case. T should be much, much smaller than the Rabi time, the time it takes for an oscillation. Okay, so that's enough for this video, and we will uh, pick up the proof of the adiabatic theorem in the next video.